Egunon, Gustioi. Good morning, dear colleagues. I'm Marta Marin. I am the Basque delegate to the European Union, and I am delighted to welcome you to the delegation today. Besides the obvious relation and long-lasting collaboration with governance uh, and the Basque Country, I would like just to mention two initiatives that the Basque government is, is working uh, on recently. And uh, I will mention the implementation of the global agenda of the SDGs. And I recall that SDG 11 calls to make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. And SDG 16 calls to promote peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development, to provide access to justice for all, and build effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. This is a recognition of the role of local regional governments in their implementation. And this is as well a recognition of the need of anticipation of partnership with business sector and social stakeholders. Therefore, we have adopted recently, just before the summer break, a Basque policy coherence framework to accelerate the sustainable human development policies to increase effectiveness and accountability for all levels of governments and administrations in the Basque Country. And this policy coherence framework is a guiding principle for policy making, not only at internal level, but as well at international level for us. And secondly, another key aspect that we are working on together with the European uh, Commission at uh, that time is the revision of the GDP as a global benchmark set of indicators. The GDP, we think, is now obsolete. And we think that um, it's not really measuring the uh, uh, coherence of policies of the progress of uh, society, of uh, cohesion uh, societies. And we think that a new set of indicators, among them human rights in business, is needed to measure and to, and to benchmark social progress uh, in our uh, societies. Therefore, we call for a social progress index to be implemented, to be a scale up, and we are uh, working in this initiative as well uh, in the Basque uh, government. Today, our task is obviously hosting you, but as well learning from you, learning from you and helping you to disseminate the very deliverable results of the project. Thank you very much for your attention. I wish you a fruitful meeting and I will be with you whenever you need. Skerrikasko, thank you. Good morning and welcome to the final conference of the Human Rights and Business Project. My name is Katerina Yanivis. I'm the project manager of this project. Uh, we're looking forward today to discuss with you the removal of barriers to access to remedy for corporate related human rights abuses. On behalf of the Globernance Institute for Democratic Governance, I would like to begin by thanking our hosts, the delegation of the Basque Country to the EU, for their hospitality and collaboration today, in particular to the delegate, Marta Marin Sanchez, uh, also to the staff, uh, Edurne Garin, Camila de Palza, Azqueta, and Arate Lesarce. Uh, to all who are here, thank you. Special thanks as well to the European Commission Civil Justice Program for their call and for their support, uh, without whom we wouldn't be here today for making this project possible. Welcome to each of you uh, here with us today in Brussels, as well as to those joining us via live streaming. Uh, we look forward to engaging you in a truly global dialogue, as we have people joining us today not only from across EU member states, uh, but also from around the world. So despite the time zones, thank you for those of you who are watching, from New Delhi to Mexico City, from Johannesburg to New York. 
For those watching live, you are invited to participate, share your thoughts, post your questions uh, using Twitter, which we'll have behind us uh, today. You'll be able to see as well, for those of you here. Uh, you can use, you can tag us in your comments. Our account is humanbusinesseu, or use the hashtag humanbusinesseu. Our moderators will be following the Twitter feed throughout the panels to incorporate your questions in our shared debate uh, after the speaker's interventions. For those who have previously sent us feedback through your online registration, we would like to thank you, and we hope that the discussion today provides some answers to some of your queries. In the next few moments, uh, what I'd like to do is share with you some of the context from around today's event, information about our project, why we're here, how and why our work began, uh, where we are now, what are the next steps, and discuss what we hope to accomplish with today's agenda. As many of you might recall, in April 2013, a factory collapsed in the Savar sub-district in Bangladesh, killing more than 1,000 people and injuring thousands more. Subsequent reports revealed substandard working conditions, overcrowding, and shoddy construction of the factory itself. This tragic loss of life and limb was preventable. Remedy for victims was largely handled through informal and non-judicial means. The Rana Plaza Donors Fund was created to collect voluntary contributions to the victims and their families with the International Labor Organization as the sole trustee. The fund was created as a humanitarian effort and was not intended to suggest or imply legal responsibility by any of the named or unnamed contributing entities. Furthermore, a confidentiality agreement was accorded surrounding the amounts contributors appropriated to the fund, many of which are company brands based here in the European Union. Rana Plaza, while not the first tragedy of its kind, was a call to action. In the same year, we formed a research consortium and were awarded the Civil Justice Action Grant by the European Commission Directorate General for Justice. Our project began the following year along three main work streams, to research, teach, and disseminate solutions for business and human rights challenges for cross-border litigation in the European Union. The particular focus of our project concerns the third pillar of the United Nations Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, greater access by victims to effective remedy, both judicial and non-judicial. Our research focused on the following question. How do we provide justice in the European Union for human rights abuses committed abroad by EU companies? We believe the solutions lie in the removal of barriers, both legal and practical, to provide effective access to remedy. Today, here in our final conference, uh, we will be outlining some of our research conclusions and collectively debating the way forward. The Human Rights and Business Project is coordinated uh, from San Sebastian, Spain, and our research consortium is composed of over 20 leading academic scholars and practitioners across six EU member states. Our research in consortium includes the University of Navarra, Frank Bold Society, the University of Castilla-La Mancha, University of Jaume I, University of Rovira y Virgili, the Case Van Dam Consultancy, Ludwig Boltzmann Institute of Human Rights, Tilburg University, Utrecht University, Leiden University, Public University of Navarra, the Law Offices of Cuatro Casas, Gonzalves Pereira, Faculty of Law of University of Rijeka. Since the commencement of the project, we have held four training sessions. The first in San Sebastian in February 2015, the second in Tilburg in June 2015, the third in Vienna in December of last year, and earlier this year in May, uh, we held our final training session in collaboration with the Dutch EU presidency and various civil society organizations in Amsterdam. All project deliverables, including past training session materials, speaker presentations, videos, podcasts, as well as a virtual library on business and human rights, are all available freely on the project website, which is broadcast behind me, uh, www.humanrightsinbusiness.eu. From the project website, you may also freely download the materials that we have distributed to you here today. Uh, this includes the executive summary of our research results, the full text will be available as a freely downloadable ebook uh, in the next few months. The link will be made available from the project homepage. Uh, for all of you who have registered online, you'll be receiving an update or a notification when that goes live. In parallel to our research results, we have also uh, disseminated today a practical handbook for civil society organizations and human rights defenders. 
The handbook is freely available for download in English, Spanish, French, and Portuguese. We invite each of you here today to share these links on your respective websites or in your networks. For those present today, we have produced also USB sticks uh, with copies, uh, PDFs of the summary research results, as well as the handbook in all four languages, particularly those NGOs who are present today uh, who work abroad, uh, who work particularly with groups that may not have high-speed internet access. We ask you to grab as many USB sticks as you'd like uh, and distribute them uh, throughout your work. Our research results are the, departure, are the departure point of our program today. After opening remarks, remarks by Professor Yut van Kalster, members of our research consortium who are responsible for coordinating the various sections of our final deliverables will set out the essence and key findings of our results as well as the contents of the handbook. After the coffee break, we will hold two panels uh, to contextualize our theoretical analysis into practice. In the morning panel, we will consider the business perspective with a particular focus on the corporate duty of care and human rights due diligence. In the afternoon, we will consider the legal and public policy perspective. Uh, and to close the day, Heidi Hautala, member of the European Parliament, will close with concluding remarks. On a last and personal note, I would like to especially thank my colleagues in the research consortium for a few years of very hard work. I've learned very much from uh, every single one of you and I think and expect great things to come uh, with the network that we've established. They say that working in the area of business human rights is like watching grass grow. Well, I hope that we've planted some seeds and that those of you who are today and uh, all really uh, who have any interest in this field will take it to the next level. Uh, what we need is multi-level and multilateral governance and participation and interest by all. So hopefully the research that we produce translates into some acts. And with that said, it is my honor to introduce you to our keynote speaker today, Professor Jurt van Kalster, uh, is an alumnus of the College of Europe, uh, independent legal practitioner at the Brussels Bar. His uh, boutique practice focuses on conflict of laws, private international law, EU and international regulatory law, especially environment, and international and EU economic law. Yurt is full professor in the University of Leuven and head of Leuven's Law Department of European and International Law. Yurt is also senior fellow at Leuven Center for Global Governance Studies and on the indicative list of WTO panelists. Professor von Kalster is a visiting professor and senior fellow at Monash University's Law Faculty in Melbourne, visiting professor at the China EU School of Law in Beijing, visiting professor at King's College London, and adjunct professor at the Brussels campus of American University. He was previously a visiting lecturer at Oxford University, uh, called to the bar in 1999, having worked in a law firm previously. Obviously, uh, great experience. We're looking very much forward to his thoughts. Uh, welcome, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's um, always humbling to hear such a long list of, here we go, F, uh, where's F5, that, someone who speaks Spanish may have to help me pull up the full slides. Thank you. I'll stay close to the microphone because I realize there are people, of course, who uh, might otherwise not hear me, or even though I could shout and they'll probably hear me in square on your weeks. If you teach a lot to a lot of students, then the voice tends to carry far. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the invite. It's exciting for me uh, to speak here, also to be asked to speak close to home normally, and you heard that from the list that was just read. I tend to travel long distances, so to be asked to speak at Brussels, living in Leuven, is a great treat. Um, sadly, though, it also means that I've had to rush in, which explains why I'm a bit warm and sweaty already. Um, I had a bit of domestic social responsibility at home. One of my children has her birthday and my wife is abroad for a number of weeks, so I had to make a cook breakfast and everything else, then get here, but it was all wonderful. And also, sadly, after my talk, I'll have to rush back to Leuven to do a bit of, I suppose, academic or educational social responsibility, because I have students uh, waiting to hear whether they've passed their resets um, or not. So I'm, certainly indeed, I won't be able to take part in your um, discussions, but I have, with many of the 
uh, authors of this report and many of the people involved in the study. And I've met them personally throughout the years. I've certainly learned a great deal from many of the things that they've been writing. Um, and you will see that in the report. You can already see it in the executive summary. This is really a very insightful, uh, complete, thought-provoking. Also, I think, um, uh, ambitious in its uh, attempts to try and remove some of the challenges with uh, corporate human rights abuse, or however one um, calls it. And I think you'll find it a very exciting uh, study, but also hopefully today's um, conference or workshop or training um, will hopefully also enable the authors to pinpoint some more of the um, uh, lacunae or perhaps challenges in, uh, not lacunae, challenges in their continuing um, work. So I'm sure that they're very much looking forward to all of you engaging rather than uh, listening. And that goes for me as well. So if I say something during my uh, short presentation that provokes you or that shocks you or that disappoints you, please let me know um, immediately. I should say, of course, that this is a very exciting worldwide global um, topic. I think it's a topic that speaks to a lot of you probably uh, in your family surroundings. I'm sure if you have children, you have at some point discussed why there's such a thing as a four euro t-shirt advertised in the streets of um, Europe. Um, corporately as well, when I was in Melbourne indeed in July, we had a, an interesting um, exchange of thoughts, probably, um, with uh, a lot of people working in the mining industry, uh, which of course in that part of um, um, Asia PAC is very uh, interested in and also working quite actively on how they could promote their own uh, compliance in terms of not just human rights, but certainly also environment, uh, occupational health and safety, um, etc. I have decided to, I'm afraid, uh, ignore the instruction to give you solutions or perhaps uh, attempts at solutions. I'm going to give you questions. Um, this is a, a, an image from a, a US TV show called 20 Questions. It's a format that the family and I have had to resort to in the summer when the kids tried to explain a game that they invented themselves and we just frankly couldn't get it. We had great fun uh, with the kids finding it hilarious that the parents just couldn't grasp these seemingly easy uh, rules of, uh, uh, of this particular game. So we resorted to 20 questions. And I'm going to ask you not 20 questions, but certainly probably four or five. Firstly, perhaps, I think it might be important to point out that, of course, we shouldn't be too pessimistic and negative about business engaging in human rights, uh, social and environmental um, compliance. This is very much a truism, but I think it's definitely true that if there is going to be a solution to uh, human rights violations, environmental issues, um, social inequality, etc., then we have to, and we are engaging uh, business in trying to find um, solutions. Um, as Judge Jacobs put in his Key Bell, this is a court of appeal judgment, which then later on went to the United States Supreme um, Court. He noted in his opinion in the Ambang decision in 2011, he put it examples of corporations in the atrocity business are few in history. And I think he's right. I'm not saying necessarily therefore that the solution he had to this was correct, but he certainly, I think, is right in pointing this out. And he had few examples. Sadly, one of them was a Belgian company involved in the Belgian Congo, and then the other uh, 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 companies were uh, uh, German corporations involved in the Third Reich. So, and he's right, there are very few, and I think that's worth uh, pointing out, and I think it's worth pointing out that business is engaged in trying to find a um, solution. And I certainly also hope that in the course of this uh, project that you have found that business um, has been engaging um, with you trying to find those um, solutions. Secondly, and this is a very tenacious challenge. It links perhaps to a little, to some degree to the four euro t-shirt that I meant um, earlier. This is what I like to call um, that externalities are in the eyes of the um, beholder. What I mean by that is that, of course, when we talk about business um, transgressing environmental rights, human rights, um, social rights, um, etc., they very often do so because of international economics. They very often do so because they find that they can produce more cheaply, more conveniently um, in other parts of the world. Then there's a bit of a chicken and egg issue, of course. Do they convince us that we um, uh, 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 want uh, four euro t-shirts uh, or whatever? Or is it us as consumers that are quite pleased 
that we can buy four euro um, t-shirts. Um, but certainly they use the absence of or relaxed standards or relaxed enforcement, often all those three together, uh, in economies and transitions, developing countries, et cetera, uh, to provide us with the products and the services that seemingly um, we are seeking. And of course, to the countries involved, what to us may seem like a negative externality, a 14-year-old, I think 16-year-old even, to all of us, we would probably argue that a 16-year-old should be at school learning either a trade or learning um, academic insight. Um, uh, that is not necessarily the case, of course, for a number of countries where they may find the same for 9, 10, 11, 12-year-olds, but where enforcing this or rolling this out across children, uh, uh, which would uh, in our societies be at school age, is, is quite a huge challenge. And of course, they also point out that if they relax some of these standards or if they discourage companies from enjoying these kinds of um, flexible working conditions, um, etc., uh, that their comparative advantage would disappear. And the question then is, of course, how do we address precisely uh, that? I think the compact, which I have on the slide there, um, the incident in Bangladesh, the terrible tragedy in Bangladesh, and there's many more, of course, was already pointed out. Um, the EU response to this uh, incident, I think, goes a long way to explain how big that challenge is. So what we did is we rolled out a so-called compact with a capital C, uh, which up until then was a non-existing instrument of international law. It probably still is a non-existing instrument of international law. It's not a treaty. It's not a protocol. It's not even a resolution. It's a compact, uh, which is almost like a training module. It will enable or it will help, it will assist, it will facilitate industries with making sure that in this particular case, occupational health and safety standards in Bangladesh are better um, complied with. But the then Trade Commissioner, Karl de Hucht, very quickly suggested that it would be a wrong answer to that tragedy to simply say we'll no longer produce at Bangladesh. Uh, because then, of course, in one big swoop, a large chunk of their foreign currency income would simply disappear. So it's a long-standing challenge. What is exactly an, an, an externality? What is a comparative advantage? What are ex acceptable comparative advantages? And what is the um, twin role, if you like, uh, that plays between the developed world and the developing world? In climate change, for instance, this is very often pointed out by China when they say our carbon is your carbon, right? Uh, the fact that they have such an abysmal CO2 emissions, etc. record is to a large degree down to EU, US, and generally Western industries producing in China. Embedded uh, uh, carbon, uh, your carbon is our carbon, and the same with some of those human rights and environmental um, abuses. Um, secondly, and this is a cartoon which might only amuse conflict of law uh, lawyers, this refers to um, something known as forum non uh, convenience, which features in the report. So if you're not a conflicts lawyer, then you should brace yourself uh, uh, before you start um, reading. This is an important uh, phenomenon in international jurisdiction, because of course when you say corporations should be responsible for, the, for their human rights, environmental and so on, general sustainability record in uh, whatever place they produce, then you're basically also saying if they don't hold up to those standards, and of course we should like to have a, an interesting court, an attractive court, a court that can um, objectively rule on these issues where these cases against those corporations um, could be heard. So you need to be able to seize a court. In the United States, the ultimate test for jurisdiction in a court very often is what is called forum non-convenience. This is basically where the court will say, well, there's also the reasons why we could hear this case. There are corporate assets of the company involved in our jurisdiction. Um, they may even have their corporate seat in our jurisdiction. Or there's a number of their directors that live in this jurisdiction or that actually carry out their business in this jurisdiction. But we still won't hear the case because we would argue, I'm speaking as the court here, we would argue that there is another court that is more naturally suited um, to hear this case. For instance, of course, um, evidently, the court in the jurisdiction where these alleged atrocities uh, or infringements have taken place. So in that case, a court like a US court could say, I'm not going to hear the case, even though there's all sorts of uh, uh, ordinary jurisdiction reasons as to why I could 
do so. And they will dismiss it on the basis of what is called forum non-convenience. The EU, in their jurisdictional rules, don't have, generally, don't have such a rule. The EU have a very straightforward rule, and I'm sure you'll hear this later throughout the day. If you want to pursue an EU-based company for alleged uh, uh, infrictions uh, committed outside of the EU, it's a piece of cake at the jurisdiction level. All you need to do is establish that they have a corporate domicile in one of the EU member states, and Bob's your uncle, you can go to that court, and they simply cannot refuse to hear the case. Applicable law is something else, and I'll come to that um, later. Inevitably, of course, this also raises the, uh, the prospect of Brexit. Right? Um, forum non-convenience is a common law uh, idea. It's a common law concept. If and when, probably when, the United Kingdom leave the European Union, they will, they might, no longer be bound by at least some of those jurisdictional rules, and they will certainly rediscover forum non-convenience. Um, How this will work in terms of corporations, but again, that would have to be the real, excuse my French, the real, well, you would have to, I'm not going to speak French, um, the, the real, it would have to be extremely opportunistic, of course, for an industry to say, we're going to relocate our business to the United Kingdom, simply because of foreign and convenience rules and of making sure that we will not be easily be sued for alleged uh, infringements. But one might imagine one or two cases where this would have been attractive to those companies um, in the past. A similar, so again, in the United States, foreign policy as well often counts in these foreign and convenience considerations. Many of you will have followed the Keo Bell case law in the United States Supreme Court and the follow-up cases, apartheid, Daimler, uh, and so on. Foreign policy considerations very much count in that forum on convenience assessment. So you will even have courts ask the Foreign Office, Secretary of State in the United States, they will ask if I were to assume jurisdiction against Corporation X uh, domiciled in the United States, would that interfere with your foreign policy priorities? And if the uh, Foreign Office were to say, yes, it would, then those courts will be inclined not to hear those cases. Trias Politica, etc. there, of course, is somewhat thrown out of the window, but it's certainly reality in quite a few of those cases in the United States, to call uh, the Rio Tinto case as just one um, example. It's also part of the current JASTA debate, but this is not unrelated, I think, to today's issue, uh, uh, legislative initiative that's going through the US Congress trying to um, assist victims of the 9-11 um, atrocities, but therefore also um, bringing foreign policy considerations into that uh, whole um, debate. I've mentioned Brexit again. Um, it's something that exercises us all uh, at the moment. I'm not sure whether um, we should really be concerned about that in the future, but I can imagine certainly one or two court cases in the past where the company involved might have wanted to relocate to uh, a non-EU member state had that been easily done. This, of course, is a target. What I want to say with this is... Um, and it links a little bit to what I said in my introduction, namely businesses being part of the solution, but of course also being just one part of the um, solutions. Especially in the EU, again, it's very easy to identify and pursue corporations on the basis of these um, sustainability issues. But of course, even if you do pursue them, even if you do get a judgment uh, against them, of course, your ultimate goal is to change things in the field which in these kinds of cases that we're discussing today is not going to be an EU field. It tends to be a non-EU um, field. And for that, of course, you need the cooperation, the engagement, the energy, the willingness of a lot of those um, foreign partners, their agencies, their agents, their ministries, um, etc. And that obviously is not always the case, partially because of those comparative advantage reasons that I mentioned earlier, earlier, partially also, of course, because of the endemic problems with governance, corruption, uh, and so on in many of those um, jurisdictions. And I cite here the example of the uh, Provoquala case and the problem with toxic waste being dumped at, at the Ivory Coast, a case that many of you um, will be familiar with. An interesting case for two reasons that I wanted to mention here. The first reason is, and you can look it up in, on my blog if you're interested, I'll put my blog on the first um, slide. The Amsterdam, an Amsterdam court a number of years ago, 
gave the company involved a reduction in their sentence because the company involved had a CSR policy. Right. So you can read the court saying, you should really be punished for X because you've done this um, uh, export of illegal waste, of, of, of hazardous waste, toxic waste even, to the Ivory Coast. But because I see that you have this brochure that tells us that you are really a wonderful company, um, I will give you a reduction in what I should have normally given you as a criminal sanction. Right. That was, I thought, quite awkward. The very existence of a CSR policy seems to have bought some time for the company concerned. But secondly, also, in the case of the Provo Koala, I was struck last year, I think, when I went to, uh, was at a workshop in, <coughs> excuse me, in Benin, and there were representatives of the Ivory Coast um, Environment Agency, and they were telling us, <coughs> excuse me, they were telling us that actually, simply, even though there has been compensation, also issued by English and Dutch courts in that particular case, the toxic waste was still where it was put X years before in the very scandal. So it goes to show that, you know, no matter what you try and do from our point of view, um, we will have to engage properly and roll out these kinds of solutions with the authorities in uh, particularly then developing um, countries. Finally, I think, I think this is my final issue uh, that I wanted to address this morning. This uh, concerns the corporate veil. Right? So somehow I managed to find an image piercing the corporate veil. It's amazing what Google Images will, uh, will, uh, will help you do. So this chap is obviously a corporate uh, person and his veil is being um, pierced. What does this concern? This concerns, of course, the issue of using a holding company. And again, a case that is going through Dutch courts, and you'll hear a lot about it today, I'm sure, uh, illustrates this. So you use a holding company, and then, of course, your holding company may be listed in um, member state uh, 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 A. Uh, and then, of course, the holding company will have a number of corporations throughout the world that will carry out local uh, business. There's nothing suspect about this at all, right? It's called a special purpose vehicle. Special purpose vehicles are perfectly acceptable, perfectly kosher. They are there for all sorts of reasons. Uh, VAT, tax, simple, easy administration, and so on. In say, they are completely uh, uh, innocent. But of course, special purpose vehicles can be um, abused, evidently. And the point about piercing, so the point about having these holdings and the special purpose vehicles is that you have a corporate veil. In other words, that not only do you shield your shareholders from any large suits against them. After all, the idea of a capitalist system is that you allow people to put money into corporations and to have those corporations act uh, independently. But it's also to make sure that a holding company, indeed, isn't always bothered by all sorts of shenanigans going on with the daughter companies across the world. Right? And again, in itself, that is perfectly fine. That's how a modern international global economy is run, and for 99% of cases, that runs really perfectly smoothly without any hint of abuse. But of course, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes, either purposely or in simply, objectively, there is such a gross violation of a sustainability um, rule, human rights, environment, social, um, and so on, that you may want to pierce this fail. That either you may want to go after the actual shareholders, or indeed, at the very least, that you may want to go after the holding company that is sitting safely in its headquarters in member state A. Right. That's called piercing the corporate veil. You'll hear today about how even if it is easy to pursue an EU-based company in the EU for activities in their name taking place outside of the EU, when it comes down to then deciding what law you apply to that alleged atrocity, things are quite a bit more difficult. That's exactly where solutions should be found. And I think it's exactly in this discussion of what law applies to this piercing exercise that there will have to be, or I think there's fruitful ground for at least an European, if not an international, thinking here of the De Haag uh, process in private international law, a European, if not an international solution to having one unified answer to this. Right? And you can see the relevance, because if you have... A, to, to name the Shell case, which you'll hear about today, I'm sure. 
If a Dutch judge were to say, how am I going to decide whether the Dutch company, holding company, is responsible for what his daughter companies have done in Mauritania, then the Dutch court could say, well, I'm going to see if, is it, what law should I use to decide whether a simple lack of compliance or of oversight is enough to say the corporation in itself, the holding company, is responsible? Or should there be more than that? Should it be active collusion? Should you actually have been engaged in these alleged um, atrocities. Right? The, the outcome is going to be very different. And you may find that, for instance, Dutch law is actually quite, might be quite liberal about this in the sense of might quite quickly say, I'm going to pierce that corporate veil. Lack of compliance is enough. Whilst Mauritanian law might say a lack of compliance is nowhere near enough. You need to have active collusion. Right? So what law you're going to use to decide this is going to have a huge impact on the outcome of your case and a huge impact on the, the answer to the question, can I simply use, I should probably say no to this, can I simply use, um, can I simply use European law as the benchmark for what our companies are doing outside of the EU? That I think is a very, very uh, uh, useful or relevant issue, and I, I have it here um, on this side. I mentioned the apartheid case, the apartheid case, concerning the US case, concerning a number of corporate usual suspects, where in the end Court of Appeal, New York said it's not enough that you can show us that they were even informed of alleged atrocities in South Africa, the apartheid regime. You need to actively show active collusion of the corporate headquarters with what has been going on in um, South Africa. So I think that would be a very useful um, uh, point of harmonization in EU um, private international law. I did give you two warnings, namely that if you're not a conflict lawyer, that I should have probably given a warning at the start of my talk, um, and secondly, that I was going to give you questions more than um, solutions. But I very much look forward to reading the full report, also to hearing about the outcome of today's um, discussions, because going back to my exam duties, which I referred to earlier, we really need to start thinking out of the box here. You know, we can't do this if we're going to stick to traditional um, uh, uh, answers, but neither should we negate some of the uh, uh, corporate and other realities uh, in this particular context. Thank you very much for having me here and for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ancosta. Uh, we might have uh, maybe just one minute for, if we want to have one question for the professor as we invite our researchers to come up. Uh, no? Okay. Well, then what we'll do then uh, is if our research and search members can uh, take to the stage, uh, we'll begin in just uh, two short minutes.